right? Let's talk about some labor terms. Right to work. State laws that prohibit contracts requiring employees to join unions as a condition of obtaining or continued employment. Uh, closed shop, a firm that requires, or an agency, a state agency that requires individuals to join a union before they can be hired. That's illegal. A closed shop is illegal. You can't require someone to become a member before they're employed. Union shop, a CBA clause that requires new employees to join a union, means 30 to 60 days after being hired. Do we kind of have a union shop? Kind of do. Don't, uh, don't employees have to serve a probationary period? Yep, in order to become a bargaining employee. They have to serve their probationary uh, 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 position. Agency shop requires employees who did not join the union to pay fees for union representation services. Do we have that? Requires employees who do not join the union to pay fees. Did we? We did. What was that called? That's right. We did have that. And then the Janus versus AFSCME changed the law. Right, that's right. Maintenance of membership requires workers to remain members of a union for a period of the CBA. Do we have that? Are you sure? Okay. Why did someone finally come out with yes? That's right. They can only get out in December. That's correct. If someone joins a member and decides to do payroll deduction for membership, they cannot cease that payroll deduction until December. It's under the union's uh, article, uh, membership article. Management rights, those rights reserved for the employer to manage, direct, and control the workplace. Do we have those? Yes. Article 18 in the Green Book and Article 5 in the Purple Book. Um, union security provision. It's a per CBA provision that aids the union in obtaining and retaining members. Do we have that in our CBA? No, we don't. Could we get one? Potentially, if someone proposed it and negotiated it. But we currently don't have that. Dues checkoff. Do we have that in our collective bargaining agreement? Yes, we do, right? It's absolutely right. We allow uh, the union to have a bargain employee to make an election to have payroll deduction for membership dues if they choose to do that. It's volunteer. They don't have to, but if they do, they do that. They can do that. So we have a checkoff provision in our collective bargaining agreement. Uh, union membership by industry. Just wanted to show you a quick overview of how unions are organizing. They're starting to organize in governments across the United States and finding that to be a very effective uh, process. And obviously it's growing tremendously as you can see that. I read an article in which uh, the unions are going to attempt to, uh, to organize oh, 100,000 new members by 2024. That's their goal. By 2024, they're hoping to organize 100,000 new members. Uh, required subjects of bargaining, as we all know, those ones are uh, hours, wages, and working conditions. So when you look at a collective bargaining agreement, pretty much between the four corners of the CBA, it's talking about hours, it's talking about wages, or it's talking about working conditions um, for those that are in the bargaining unit. Uh, some of our articles in the contract require us to negotiate further. Example, Article 18 or 5, Management Rights requires us to notify the union to negotiate if we're going to move a bargaining employee from a brick and mortar building to a brick and mortar building. If we're going to create or update agency policy that impacts a working condition on a bargaining employee, you must notify the union and negotiate that to impasse. Or a health or safety issue, you must notify the union and negotiate to impasse. Negotiate to impasse, not impasse arbitration. So you never would go before an arbitrator but you do have to negotiate and let the union have an opportunity to be heard and voice their concerns or uh, ask questions about why we're moving someone from this building to another building or why are we updating the policy to say this now, what's the impact that it may or may not have. So we have to notify and negotiate the impasse. There are permissive subjects by labor laws that you can negotiate, for example, benefits for retired employees, what was a permissive subject that we had in our CBA? Does anybody know? We had one. Fair share. Pursuant to our law, Public Employees Bargaining Act, our labor law, fair share was a permissive subject of bargaining. So if one party waived that they did not want to negotiate that or discuss it, then you didn't have to be forced to discuss it. It was a permissive subject. And then there are illegal subjects like putting provisions in a collective bargaining agreement that would be illegal on hiring practices or processes. 
often, I think both parties think that when they negotiate a contract, it's good, it's clean, it's not illegal. However, if someone was to find out later on through the process that a provision was illegal, the parties would have to go back to the table and clean up that illegal article of provision if that occurred. I don't believe we have anything in our current collective bargaining agreement that's illegal. I think we're sound with our CBOs. Questions on that? Hours, wages, and working conditions are pretty broad. Working conditions are when you change someone's schedule. <clears throat> working conditions are when you discipline someone because that affects their working condition. When you change them from a brick and mortar building to a brick and mortar building, that's affecting their working condition. You have to notify the union and negotiate that you're moving Betty White from this office to another office down the hall. No, not offices. You can direct the work of under your management rights. But when you start moving them from a building to another building, you must notify. Duty to bargain in good faith. How often do we hear that? Does anybody uh, deal with grievances? And you'll see often in grievances you have failed to, to uh, uh, comply with the car contract in good faith. Often that's, that terminology is thrown around often, and I think sometimes it may be slightly misused. Um, what bargaining good faith is is more about these three kind of elements from the labor world of just trying to actively participate in negotiations to final, reach some final agreement, to make a sincere effort to reach a common ground, and or create binding agreements on mutually accepted terms that both parties agree to this collective bargaining agreement. That's bargaining in good faith. Bad bargaining is showing up and not showing interest, uh, making uh, 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 um, counters that are just like ineffective or um, canceling sessions and not showing up. Um, regress the bargaining, meaning you made a provision, you made a, a, a counter last, last week you're in a session and now you try to withdraw your counter. That's regressive bargaining, you can't do that. So it's just a sincere effort that you know both parties are trying to reach an agreement to get a collective bargaining agreement that you can both live with, that you can both deal with moving forward and come up with an agreement. If the parties do not reach an agreement on a collective bargaining agreement, does anybody know what would happen? You would end up going before an arbitrator. And so then you'd have to go to uh, impasse arbitration the arbitrator, what the parties would select an arbitrator, and then an arbitrator would hear the two parties' collective bargaining agreements and make a decision on who is the best CBA, and that arbitrator would pick one or the other. He wouldn't pick some from this CBA proposal or some from this proposal. He would eventually say, this is the proposal I'm going with, and this is the new collective bargaining agreement for a party. So I think it behooves the parties to try to find an agreement and a contract they can live with versus allowing some arbitrator who doesn't know you, is not familiar with your state, you're familiar with your environment, and tell you what CBA you're now going to live with. So it is better that the parties come with a sincere effort to reach a common ground and get a CBA. Employees Bargaining Act, that is the labor law that is established here in New Mexico. It is the Public Employees Bargaining Act, which establishes how we have to guarantee the right to organize and bargain, so we're not a right-to-work state, so unions have the right in the state of New Mexico to organize. We can't kick them off our property like the Girl Scouts or the Avon lady and say, you can't sell your products, get off the property. The union wants to organize, let's say Teamsters tries to organize, pipe fitters or whatever tries to organize. They have a right to come into the state and try to organize, we can't kick them off our property. We can tell them that you have to remain in the foyer, you set your table up here, can't walk through the halls and disturb the workplace and talk to employees, but we'll let employees know you're here and they can come visit your table or your booth uh, during their pre-hours, post-hours, lunch break, or regular breaks, but not to disrupt the workplace if a union is trying to organize. So they have a right to organize. We should promote a cooperative relationship between the parties in the state of New Mexico, and we should protect public interest. So what's promoting a cooperative relationship? between this employer and unions? What's promoting a positive relationship? Knowing each other, getting along, going to dinner together? <laughs> Not necessarily. I think it's more about are we listening to each other's positions or sides or viewpoints, and are we trying to find solutions and resolutions? I think that's promoting a positive relationship. And then protecting public interest is probably that we're trying to find solutions through our journeys. If there's grievances or prohibited practice complaints filed, 
versus always litigating and causing more financial problems than it's worth is kind of protecting public interest and not always in dispute would be a good way to look at it. The PIVA, the Public Employees Bargaining Act, is the statute that establishes the unions, the right to organize, and then from that effectuated the PLRB, the Public Employees Labor Relations Board. It's made up of three members. The union selects a member, notifies the governor, and the governor appoints that member. The state selects a member, notifies the governor, and the governor appoints that member. And then the member from that's appointed from labor and management finds a neutral person, a third person, and they notify the governor and the governor appoints that. And then you have a three member board that hears uh, pre prohibitive practice complaints that may go before them or hear about an agent, the union that may be trying to organize a new agency or a subset groups of classifications or accretions. Uh, That's what the PLRB hearing officer over here. So there's a hearing officer that hears these issues makes a recommendation to the board, and then the board either upholds it, amends it, or overturns it. Does that sound familiar to maybe the state personnel board and the ALJs? They hear a disciplinary appeal, they make a recommendation to the board, and the board either upholds it, amends it, or overturns uh, a disciplinary appeal. So the boards are much like this the first state. part, is that completed at all? With different processes. So a grievance has to be filed in how many days? 30 calendar days, a grievance must be filed. A prohibitive practice complaint can be filed by the employer or by the a union, and they have six months to file a prohibitive practice complaint. And you're alleging, when you file a prohibitive practice complaint, a, the parties are alleging a violation of the PLRB the articles in the CBA. All right. So a little bit about that. Here's the two labor organizations they have in the state of New Mexico, AFSCME, which has 14 agencies that they have organized, and CWA has 11 agencies that they have organized. Between the two unions, they have organized 54% of the classified workforce. So it's good information to know, and it might have been a test question. Hint, hint. So any questions on that? Yes. DCA, DOH, and HSD has both AFSCME and CWA represented members. Um, I will say HSD is more AFSCME than CWA, DOH and CWA, and DCA are more CWA than they are AFSCME. But they have bargaining unit members in both unions. So talk about herd and cat. You gotta know which ones are in which labor organization. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, who can't join the union according to PIVA, right? Our labor law says that those who can't join are managers and supervisors. Are we sure that our supervisor means an individual who has the authority in the interest of the employer to hire, transfer, suspend, lay off, or call, promote, discharge, assign, reward, or discipline other employees or responsibilities, direct the work, or to adjust their grievances? This includes evaluating. So the PLRB made a ruling in 2014 that the lieutenants at the New Mexico Corrections Department were now part of the bargaining unit. They were called, that at the time, Corrections said the lieutenants were in management, and the lieutenants wanted to be organized. So they filed a petition, went before the PLRB, and the PLRB ruled on three of those underlying elements. That's what the PLRB determined, what is a supervisor or manager. They have to be able to have some input some action, some authority to hire, discipline, and evaluate. And the, uh, the lieutenants didn't meet that threshold. And so now they're in the bargaining unit because they didn't meet that three-pronged th threshold. So employers, when you go back and you want to call someone a supervisor, make sure this is occurring. Some authority, some input, insight. They don't have to sit on a panel, but do they get to give you know, some kind of input on that hiring? Do they get to get some input on discipline? And that was the one that hurt them the most because the union was saying the lieutenants never disciplined, the wardens disciplined them. And so that took away that authority kind of thing. So make sure your supervisors are meeting that threshold. <coughs> Questions on that? Um, Bargaining unit indicator for those of you in HR, and most of you are, 
This is really important to understand because this dictates that I know 54% of the agencies organized or uh, classified workforce is organized by the input that you give in the share system on the two-digit bargaining code. The A represents AFSCME agencies, the C represents CWA agencies. That's the first sec uh, indicator of the two-digit bargaining code. And then the second indicator is telling us, yes, why they're represented, that classification, biz -op specialist, has been organized. It's in Appendix R in the CBA, telling me biz -op specialists at CYFD are organized, so it should be an AY. If the, biz, if the uh, person is a supervisor, they should be an AN, because they're not, they can't be organized. Or the AN means uh, administrative clerks, for example. Admi let's say administrative clerk classification has not been organized at CYFD, so you would put an AN. AFSCME represents is at CYFD, but they have yet to accrete or organize that administrative clerk Classification, so it would be an A to N. Management's always an N, or classifications that have yet to be organized is an N. That's the second digit. Uh, if an employer wants to make someone confidential, so Betty White's a biz op specialist, she's in the union, that classification's in the union, but CYFD decides to make Betty White confidential, then I would move, if I'm Betty White, I'd move from an AY to an AC. But employer, you have to be able to defend that Betty White's duties and responsibilities are of confidential status. So Betty White seeing payroll does not make Betty White confidential. Betty White seeing discipline and draft, Betty White seeing policy and draft, Betty White being privy to uh, information that's in draft before it goes public, uh, like budget or things like that or changes, then Betty White could probably meet the definition of confidential. If the union believes Betty White's telling them, I'm not doing any confidential work. They just, I don't know why they did that. I'm not doing confidential work. Then the union can take it to the PLRB and challenge the employer as to what the duties are and if they meet the confidential threshold. If you lose, Betty White's going from AC to A, Y, right? If you were to lose before the PLRB, or the PLRB just ruled against you and said, no, she's not doing enough confidential duties. She doesn't meet that threshold. And I'll be honest, I don't have any um, rulings from PLRB yet on confidential. We just have the ones on supervisors now, but we don't have one on confidential. So I just always tell employers, make sure you can change someone to a confidential status, but make sure it's truly confidential work. Doing payroll is not confidential. Why is that? Does anybody know why that is? It's not. Why payroll is not confidential? I'm sorry? Yep, it's public information, so that doesn't make it confidential. You may want it, but it's not. All right, so it's really important to know how we do these, these statuses. The S and the M are saying that the union represented classification, the union owns biz op specialists, but maybe you decided to make Betty White temporarily a supervisor. <coughs> Maybe you're giving her a little bit of an MCOP or something as because you don't have a classification there yet. That would make Betty White an AS. But as soon as you're done making her a supervisor, you go back to AY. Does that make sense? Or AM. So the secretary of an agency shouldn't be an AM. Secretary of an agency should be a AN, right? Not organized, not represented. It's a managerial classification. Right. Any questions on that? Clear as mud or? Yeah. And again, the more you put the input, the information in correctly, the more we understand who's in the bargaining unit and who's not, right? Based on that. All right. Uh, talks about union membership cards. You've seen the new ones come out. We had the whole, I said earlier on in, the, in this uh, introduction that this is a new environment with the new administration. Our employees are their members, their members are our employees. We need to learn how to get along. And I think it's great that we're getting along. We learn how to uh, respect each other and have conversation on how we can resolve some of these concerns that may arise if a grievance arises or a prohibitive practice complaints arise. But in that dialogue with the unions, one of our little resets to have moving forward was that we would agree on what a new union card would look like from AFSCME and from CWA. They created these cards. These are the official cards that bargaining employees would be filling out if they wanted to pay membership dues through payroll deduction. 
Can an employee fill out a card for fair share fees through payroll deduction? That's correct. They cannot. So we want to look at, make sure that these are the cards that are filling out. Agencies, when you get a bargain employee who wants to start for, uh, membership dues and they hand you the card, you got to make sure the card comes to the state personnel labor relations person and we initiate it for you, not you. We initiate payroll deduction for membership dues. We initiate payroll deductions for people or COPE. People is for AFSCME, COPE is for CWA, and that's a, a political kind of thing if a bargaining employee wants to give to the political arena as well as pay membership dues. And so, if I heard you correctly, we're not entering the union? We are. Yeah, State Personnel Labor Relations is. It was something the unions asked us to change the business process. We sent out emails indicating to do so. So if you get the card from the bargaining employee, PDF it and email it to labor.relations at state.nm.us. That's the same email box. And we will initiate it and we'll let you know we started it so that you can, and you have the card so you can put it in their personnel file, right? If we get the card first, we'll initiate it and we'll give you a copy of the card so you can put it in the personnel file. And then uh, Labor Relations, Drew or Marco will notify AFSCME or CWA that we have started payroll deductions for membership dues. Is it true for canceling as well? Cancel right, so good question, because yeah, I'm getting there next. Um, canceling, when can they cancel <laughs> payroll deduction? First two weeks. December. Yep, December, right? The first two full calendar weeks of December. So you gotta look at a calendar, and when does our calendar day start? Well, has anybody read the CBA? It, it says it, Saturdays. Yeah, and, and so, on Saturday starts a full calendar week, right? So you have to look at the calendar and see when the first full two full weeks, calendar weeks start in December. And I already looked. It's actually the first two weeks in December. Yay! It's easy this year. So um, bargaining employees will want to cease payroll deduction for membership dues if they come to you with a written document because it says in writing that they want to cease you, employer, if it comes to you first, not me, it comes to you first, you must direct the employee to go talk to their union. It comes to you, tell them, nope, you need to take this letter or go talk to your union first. You need to provide it to the union, don't give it to me. Then the union will give it to me telling me, yes, we're approving them to cease payroll deductions. If it comes to me first, I still have to do what you just, what I told you to do. I have to tell the employee, go to the union, talk to them, give them your notice of wanting to cease payroll deductions. Why do you think the union wants that? What's that, Mike? Try to convince them not to. I'm sure. I'm sure they want to have a discussion and say, hey, bro or sister or whatever, brother, why are you quitting? Don't quit. Let's talk about it. What are the great benefits that being a union member provides to you and what your dues give you? And they do. They do give a lot of benefits. Both CWA and AFSCME have a lot of benefits by paying membership dues. It's kind of like being a Costco member, the gas is cheaper, the tires are cheaper, maybe get a vacation trip. It's kind of the same concept with being a member for the union. So we want to leave that discussion up to the union talking to their members, right? Not us explaining it. The union explains to their members what that business process is. The only reason the employer is involved is because we have negotiated a process to have dues done through payroll deduction. That's why we get involved. But once the union says, yeah, drop Betty White, she's been approved, we will cease Betty White's payroll deductions in the system. Any questions on that? It's a new business process changed, yes? Once you cease deductions for a member, are you going to notify you? Yes. We'll notify you that we have ceased Betty White's deductions. The union have already said, yes, please do it. We will do it. And hopefully SPO's records will match up with the union's records on who started and who stopped. Right. So, do I have bargaining employees now sending me emails wanting to stop payroll deduction? Yes. yes. Do you get them? Yes. What are you telling bargaining employees who want to see some today? They have to wait till December. I've had bargaining employees say, okay, well, keep my email and uh, just start see some in December. No, I'm not the bank. I'm not a deposit slip. Nope, not going to allow that. I always tell them, nope, you need to resubmit your request in December to your union is what I tell them. And I openly give them 
Connie Durr's email address or Donald O'Leary's email address and or phone numbers. And then let them have that discussion with their union. And when the union notifies state personnel to cease, then we'll do so. We'll let you know too, starting and stopping. Any questions on that? When would an employer cease payroll deductions and state personnel is not involved? When they're terminated. Yep, terminated. What else, Katrina? When they're promoted. They change agencies, change classifications that might get them out of the bargaining unit, or they change from HSD, AFSCME, to DOT, I mean GSD, CWA, right? So we would stop the payroll deduction for AFSCME on Betty White. She goes to GSD, which is a CWA agency. Do we start her payroll deductions for CWA? Thank you, people who went like this. Because we don't. When do we start them? <laughs> they give us that card. That's the whole acknowledgement that they want us to do it. If they don't give us, yeah, that's right. But I got to make sure I have a card because that's telling me they clearly want to do it or they clearly do not, right? So we just because they change unions doesn't mean we, they were doing them here, they start them over here. We wait till we get a card. All right. Clear is my clear is clear. All right, good. I think everybody knows that. We want to make sure we're using these cards. I'm already getting cards from employees that aren't either one of these. So I am notifying the union that I received this card. It doesn't look like the one we made an agreement with. Please let me know what you want me to do. And I'm trying to understand if they're going to start interjecting additional cards or different cards, but I certainly am looking for that. So I'm just kind of working with the unions to figure out what they want me to accept or not accept. Right. Um, management rights. So they're pretty much summarized between the two collective bargaining agreements. And I just want to make sure you know these are your sole exclu exclusive rights, one through eight, which means you don't have to notify one through eight. You don't have to notify the union to negotiate to impasse. But when you get to 9, 10, and 11 in the green book, and you get to 9, and it's not really 9, 10, 11 in the purple book, it's I, J, K, and L. When you get to those three in the purple book, you have to notify the union to negotiate to impasse. Not impasse arbitration, but impasse. And that means when the parties have reached a point where they agree to disagree, then employer, you're going to move folks to a different building. Employer, you're going to deploy your policy. Or employer, you're going to deploy that schedule. Or employer, you're going to deploy that health and safety, whatever issue is going on. Okay, But you got to give them notice. It's always recommended you give the unions at least a 30-day notice of any of those three changes or four changes at least a month's notice so that you have an opportunity to tell them, hey, this is what's happening, give you an opportunity to meet, negotiate it. And if you guys get an agreement right away, then great, more power to you. If you reach impasse, you reach impasse, and then you deploy it on the date. The labor relations is a template that we really want you to utilize when you have to notify the union on a 9, 10, 11, or 12. We think it's clean, it's crisp, it's putting them on notice, and it moves through the process. So if you're going to do 9, 10, 11, or 12, please contact Labor Relations if you do not have that template notice. And we'll give it to you, and you can fill it in. Any questions on these? They're pretty powerful. Even though it's one page for management rights, number one is pretty powerful, number eight is pretty powerful. Uh, four is they all are. They're very powerful. It still puts you in the I'm the sheriff in town position. You're still managing the business. All right. Um, here are the union rights. And I summarized both of them based on all of it in the union rights provision and other provisions of the article. Put them here. This is their union rights that they get to do. They get to uh, obviously consult with employees, investigate grievances present grievances, meet with management to settle, adjust the grievance, meet with new hires. Yes, they get to meet with new hires and orientation. It's in the collective bargaining agreement. They can go do facility visits. And uh, I'll come back to the form in a minute. Disciplinary actions or ORMs, they get to represent their members through that process. Meet and agree, uh, meetings agreed to by the parties when you agree to meet with a steward or a bargaining employee. Um, union meetings. Use of state equipment, use of internal state email systems, steward training, and negotiating agency policy. They have a right to all these activities, and the union time form now indicates that they get union time for all these activities. So the union time form needs to be your guiding chart 
even though the CBA doesn't say exactly that because we came up with an agreement and our reset with this new environment and the unions. And so use the union time form to guide you through what activities and when they get to use union time. I'll, I'll show you the form in a minute. But let me go back to information provided weekly, monthly, and quarterly. I want you all to know that weekly, monthly, and quarterly, both unions are provided information on their members. The, month, the bi-weekly one is who's paying membership dues. So bi-weekly, they get a list of Betty White and John Wayne and everybody else that are paying membership dues. Do payroll deduction, right? Obviously, right? Because it's our data coming out. If it's someone that goes and gives a check to the steward, I don't know that. So they, they must track that differently. Uh, monthly, they get a list of bargaining employees who have retired or been dismissed. Retired or dismissed. They get a list so now they know they no longer have that member, right? Betty White retired. Um, and then the quarterly report tells them about their bargaining employees, where they work, the address, the phone number, their classification, their hourly rate, their pay band, all that information about them at work on top of their home address and their home phone number. So they get that quarterly about their members. So they get to know about their members. Yes? You said on the monthly report it's uh, retirees and those that have been dismissed. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah. She said, how about those that have resigned? Same thing. Resigned, dismissed, terminated, retired. They'll just they'll be in a category by themselves on a spreadsheet. And this, this, this is letting them know. These members are no longer your members, right? No longer around. And then, and then the monthly report, so a quarterly report. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. If you noticed every time I kept saying it, what did I keep saying? The the the, the information is about whom? They're bargaining unit employees, not members. Bargaining employees, all of them, all 54%, right? Not just those who pay membership dues. It's their bargaining unit. They get information on all of their bargaining information, on their bargaining unit, all employees in the bar, the 54%. They don't get information about any of us in this room, but they get information about their bargaining unit. So let's talk about that. Someone's in the bargaining unit and they're not paying membership dues. What does that mean? Does it change the outcome for the bargaining employee who chooses not to pay membership dues? No, right? So they're still treated the same. So they're part of the bargaining unit because it's a classification that got organized. That's the bargaining unit. They still are in the bargaining unit, so they still get the privileges of the collective bargaining agreement, regardless if they pay membership dues or not. And they still, um, um, the union should be representing them just as vigorously as those who pay membership dues, right? So what's the difference between someone who pays membership dues and someone that doesn't? What are some of the advantages of being a mem paying membership dues? I'm sorry? Yes, they get the right to vote on ratification of a collective bargaining agreement. They also get the right to vote in their locals for those who's going to be a president or a vice president. <coughs> what else? If you're a member, you can become a steward and you can run for office to be a president or vice president. If you're probably not paying membership dues, you don't get to be a steward and or run for office in a local. Yeah, that I'm aware of. And I've asked the unions to clarify it, and that's what they're telling me. That's the difference. 100,000 in 2024, that's an ambitious goal. I think they could get that. Have I seen a lot of cards coming in since the uh, beginning of the year? Yes, they both asked me and CWA have done a really, I think, outstanding job of getting membership, people to join the union and pay membership dues. I think they've done a pretty good job of of doing that so it's, it's increased again I just want to make sure you understand all these what is in here does anybody see something that's in here that wasn't in here in the CBA that may stick out that I definitely want you to always refer to the, the union time card because it gives everything in there steward training was in there for CW for ask me but not for CWA it's always been they can go to union meetings what's what what can't they not get union time for? What's something that they call this fancy name that they have these kind of what Kate Katrina said union meetings? What do they call them? Mm -hmm. Lunch and learns. Bada boom, bada bing. 
Lunch and learns, they do not get union time for that. If they want to do a lunch and learn, they usually do it during the lunch hour, and it's very expansive, like 11.30 to 1.30, because they're trying to ca capture employees' lunch hours to come, and they usually serve pizza and some, something to drink, some soda, and they, you know, talk to their members, right? Those are lunch and learns. They don't get union time for lunch and learn. But what's new here is ORMs. It was never in the CBA. It's in the, where's ORMs talked about? Talked about in the state personnel board rule, isn't it? But it wasn't in the collective bargaining agreement. So now they get union time if the steward wants to represent someone in an ORM. Okay. That's why I think the union time form is coming up here. Bada boom, here it is. How many of you have seen it or not seen it? Who has not seen it? Okay, do you have bargaining employees that work for you? You better get a copy of that. So this is pretty extensive, and the, and the red line is, do they have a copy of it right now? Um, it should be their packets. Is it in your packets? It's easier to read in your manual than it is on the screen. It's small, too? Oh, my God. I'm sorry, killing me. Um, yeah, that's ridiculous. So we'll just look at the screen. Um, but if you see it, we try to categorize it. In grievances, in disciplinary appeal process, meetings agreed to by the party, there's two boxes in there. Cross-agency representation, steward shadowing is new. So they can have up to two stewards to shadow the great steward, the good knowledgeable steward, in investigatory interviews, oral response <laughs> meetings, and face-to-face -face meetings. So two stewards can sit in the background. They can't participate, but they can observe their, their great steward, who's really knowledgeable, so that they can get knowledgeable. And so everybody gets union time. The only one that's obvious that doesn't get union time, and I got a phone call about it, was the one that says leave without pay. I kind of thought that was self-explanatory, but someone called me and said, oh, so they get union time for leave without pay. <laughs> no. Leave without pay is literal. It's leave without pay. But it's in the CBA where a bargaining employee, a steward, or an officer, and an officer is defined as a vice president or president, can get leave, can request leave without pay for some of their activities, but um, and or they all get union time. And then ask me says only steward training and PLRB meetings, right? So you want your bargaining employee to check one of those, what they're going to go to. Is it an LMC? Is it negotiations? What they're going to, they check. They kind of give the approximate amount of time up there, and then they give the real amount of time here. Because they may say, I think two hours, and then they come back and say, oh, it was two and a half. So then they give the approximate amount of time. They need to change their timesheet to say union time for this activities in here. So we need to go by this until this probably gets memorialized in the CBA, and then you can refer to the collective bargaining agreement. Any questions, trees? So on the leave without pay, Yes, because it's in there. There's a box here on the bottom. Leave without pay request. Yep. Sure are. Um, yes, that's so, um, so in the contract, there's there's a lot of amounts of hours. So things for like things that are identified in the contract, like an ORM or a disciplinary. Um, is there a maximum amount of time that we should be approving for them? So remember the green book. AFSCMEs does have time. So we still adhere to that time. Even though it's not on this form, we want to still adhere to it. Some of them say, one of them, we did put up to two hours or something in one of them. But the CWA, CBA never had time elements on it. It's a reasonable amount of time. So that means you, employer, must work with that bargaining employee, steward, or officer on what the two of you agree is a reasonable amount of time. Right? To, to allow them to go do that activity on union time. So make sure employees are changing their timesheet to show union time for whatever it is they're going to. Then HR gets it, signs off on the very bottom, and then we want HR to send it to either Connie Durr or Donald Leary, depending on what union you are. Um, and I had the, one of the unions call me and say, we're not getting any of these forms, and I know people are going and using it, and we're not getting them submitted to us. So I said, okay. So I, I think I sent out an email reminder, everybody, make sure you're sending them to the union. They want to see, I guess, what their members' activities are or that they're doing it. This form is not intended to try to necessarily over-police people. I see it as a form that protects both parties. It's been asked, and you proved it, folks. It protects both parties. They asked, and it's been approved. 
So it's just a good way to make sure everybody's clean and no one's questioning anybody. What are you doing over here? Why are you here? And whatever's going on. It protects both parties. So we really need to make sure we're using this union time form. As you all know, negotiations are getting started. And so with that, they get to use union time for negotiations. All right. If they are a member, I will notify you who the members will be. I already did for CWA agencies. Do you all know? I've notified the CWA agencies who the members are for CWA at the negotiating table. Once AFSCME provides that information, I'll provide that to you as well for the AFSCME agencies. I'm sorry, I was supposed to repeat a question, which was? If it's not specified, if the time frame is not specified by the contract. Right. If the time frame is not specified by the contract, how is the employer to do that? Reasonable amount of time in CWA, AFSCME CBA still has time frames, and we still need to adhere to those up to two hours, up to this, up to eight, up to eight. So we can still use that for that contract, but CWA's has always been reasonable. So please, you two decide what is reasonable amount of time to do that activity. Any questions on this? Please send them to the union, HR, when you get the form, or the supervisor gets the form, as long as the union gets it. Um, grievances, I just want to make sure, folks, to be the best knowledgeable individual, you should really know these contract articles. If you know them well, you're probably in a better position to not get grieved and or be able to find some resolution to it. These often tend to be the ones that are the most active and get grieved, and so it's best. The first articles are AFSCME CBA, and the second number is CWA CBA, just so you know. But if you know these, you're in, you're in good, good, staking, good position to maybe prevent some of this activity from occurring. Always always encourage employees to come talk to you first before they file. Helps us try to resolve it because everybody has a different viewpoint and it's good to understand the other person's viewpoint. Um, grievance process timelines, just for those that are visual, who, who doesn't know a timeline in here? I mean, seriously, three grievance process, three steps. Why do we have grievance arbitration in the CBA? First of all, people requires it. It's in the state statute that says we must negotiate a grievance arbitration process. Why do we want a grievance arbitration process? Remember when I said earlier, PIBA said we have to uh, protect public interest? It gives the parties an opportunity to have discussion, face-to-face -face meetings, and see if we can find a solution and resolve this because there's misinterpretation, no communication, whatever it might be. Someone's, uh, you know, thinks this is going on and so they really don't have all the facts. It gives the parties an opportunity to find a solution before we have to litigate it. But if the parties can't and we agree to disagree, then there's an arbitration process that is more expeditious than taking things to court. Because if you file something in district court, it probably takes over a year before you even get a calendar date. So it is more expeditious to go through this process, see if the parties can find a solution, if not, then we go to arbitration, if the parties agree to disagree. Um, but it just talks about all the time frames, and it's good to understand those time frames of what they're counted for, what you're complied to reply to. I really encourage agencies to respond at all three steps. I really encourage agencies to have grievance meetings, face-to-face -face meetings. Um, that really gives you a better insight of what this issue is about. Uh, sometimes a one-page grievance really isn't a whole lot of information. And sometimes they say articles that you just don't understand how they even got there. So if you have that meeting, you can get clarity and you can ask a lot of follow-up questions and you better, employer, to go back and do the research you need to do to see if you did violate those articles or you did not. But maybe thinking about, even though you're going to say, I didn't violate those articles, can you start thinking about a solution? Can you start thinking about how to resolve issues? I always tell employees, have you thought about that? And sometimes they say, no, I'm not thinking about that. I didn't do it. I'm denying it. Done. <laughs> it helps you to think a little bit about it, right? Well, how could I resolve this? What is really Betty White upset about? Is it her perceptions become a reality? The rumors have just captured her and she can't get out of it? Is there really something that went on? Did the supervisor really say this? Did something come out that upset her? I don't know, so let's ask. Let's have a meeting and get some you know, information some from foundational. And I've been a lot of your agency's face-to-face -face meetings. Y'all ask great questions, great follow-up questions, get good information, make your analysis. You can still deny it,
but at least you have a better understanding. And what's a positive about those meetings is often you can be, without realizing it, quietly training stewards. Ah, they didn't even realize you were training them. <laughs> You're training them, and they don't even realize it. I just had a meeting with a steward the other day, and we walked away, and he was so grateful what me and Marco were telling him. He just didn't know it. He, this is great. And we were like, yeah, we're fun to have. We're like, we trained the steward. No, just kidding. But it does. It does help, right? You get educated. Both parties get educated because people do have different viewpoints from where they're standing, where they're sitting. So it's good to hear people out. Makes you more knowledgeable. Just want to make sure we understand time frames. Grievance resolutions, obviously, if you're going to go to a face-to-face -face meeting, have you been given the authority to make a decision right then and there? Or you hear the issue out and you tell them, thanks for the information, we'll get back to you. Is your settlement in your grievance response, we talked about it at the face-to-face -face meeting, we agreed to do this, that, and you did this, and this grievance is now settled, it's resolved and complete, and it moves no forward. Or does your agency want maybe your attorney to draft up a real settlement? Find out your business processes. Make sure you're consistent in them. But either way is fine, but just make sure you know that if you're the decision maker or not. Stay cool, calm, and collect as a cucumber, right? Don't get emotional. Don't get upset. If you know the supervisor that's been grieved is going to get upset, maybe that's not the person to bring to the meeting, right? Do often. We, how many of us see stewards that don't bring the grievance? Yeah, a lot of us. There could be a reason behind it. Maybe we didn't let the grievance off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe the grievance is going to get upset. The steward knew it, or the steward just felt like, I can do this, and I don't need the grievance there. So same thing with us, right? Decided we're going to do and try to see if we can find something. Please don't make settlement that erodes your rights, though, or confl conflicts with the CBA or your agency policy or even the board rule, right? Got to make sure. But if you're going to make a settlement, it's memorialized even in your grievance response or it's memorialized in settlement. Don't walk away and say, yeah, it's cool, we got it. Don't worry about it. Take care of it. And nothing's memorialized. That's important, okay? Because I've seen people come back and say, I didn't say that. Do you remember when Trees can do little? Remember that one? They were stewards were saying, we didn't say that. And we had to go back to the table and kind of negotiate it. There may be technical difficulties for the audience in cyberware, just warning you. Uh-oh. Oh, it was bad. Any questions on this? It's really important. If we can find resolution, that's, I think, more power to both parties than it is to litigate. But sometimes the parties have to go, and off we go. All right? Disciplinary process, Article 24 in the Green Book, Article 7. Please make sure when you are getting ready to take discipline on a bargaining unit employee that you got your ducks in a row, that employer, you have just cause, right? Because that's what this is about. An appeal is going to say to the arbitrator, you don't have just cause, employer. So you've got to make sure at the outset of getting ready to discipline someone and you, there's something that's going on, you're going to conduct an investigatory interview, right? And you have to tell the bargaining employee what? Everybody knows this. What do we have to tell the bargaining employee? <laughs> conduct an investigatory interview tomorrow at 3 o'clock and it may lead to discipline, right? That's what the CBA says to do. We've also agreed with the unions that we also should say, and you have the option to bring a union rep if you choose to. So you should say, it may lead to discipline, and if you want to bring a rep, go ahead. You should say both those, right, moving forward. All right, in an investigatory interview. And uh, obviously, if the employee requests it, you gotta, you got to provide it with that. So let's talk about this wine garden rights. I want to be very clear. Wine garden rights is a private sector ruling from the Supreme Court. And what kind of employer are we? What? What did you say, Jamie? What did someone say? What kind of employer are we? Well, we're government, but public. We're a public employer versus a private employer. So you're right, public. We're a, so public employer is bound by what? What have I said earlier? What, got, what statute guides us? Public Employees Bargaining Act. That's that's what what provides us. Does anybody know what dictate what provoke, what direction private employers go? NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, 
and the National Labor Relations Act, NLRA. We've got an act, Public Employees Bargaining Act, and we got a board called Public Employee Labor Relations Board. Hmm, I wonder if that's a test question. All right. So we have this wine garden rights. The how, how long have the unions been saying they have wine garden rights? For a decade, right? What wine garden rights says is they have a right to a union rep during an investigatory interview, and that's what this document says. An investigatory interview only. If they invoke it or we tell them it may lead to discipline, they invoke it, great. If we tell them it may lead to discipline and they want to get a union rep and they bring one, great. What happens if a bargaining employee does not bring a union rep to an investigatory interview? Do you con continue the investigatory interview employer? Yeah, then you get started. That's right. If they invoke it while you're in your fifth question of interrogation, I'm just kidding. We don't interrogate. We do what? We ask questions. We do not interrogate. We're fact finders, right? So when we're asking questions and the bargain employee on the fifth question says, whoa, whoa, I think, wait, stop. I want a union rep. Do we stop? No, we absolutely do. We allow them to go get a union rep? We absolutely do. But you can start dictating an employer how much time, like uh, in a half an hour, try to get a rep. You gotta use your judgment. If it's at the end of the day and it's 4.15 and they're trying to rally up a rep and they keep saying they can't get one, might you have to reschedule? Potentially, potentially, yes. So think those minds. But, um, they have a right, employ reasonable belief that the discipline or other adverse consequences may result from what he or she is saying to you, employer, they have a right to request a union rep. We, have we been doing that for a decade? Yes, we have. The unions call it wine garden rights. I think the employer from the public sector, state government, is more or less allowing that type of rights because the contract says it. Just want to remind you that we let them have a union rep and investigatory interview. Any questions? Who answers during that investigatory interview? The employee. Does the union rep get to? No. no. It, even, it even outlines it. It says it's to guide them and counsel them. Can a union rep tell a bargaining employee, don't answer that, Betty White? Don't answer it. Can the, can the union rep tell Betty White, don't answer that question? Yes. And can Betty White say, I'm not going to answer that? Yes. More or less. But I think often investigators tell employees that they need to, what? Comply and cooperate with an investigation, right? But I guess if Betty White wants to listen to the steward and say, don't answer, I guess then you will make your conclusion, investigator, on whatever information you've gathered, right? And then you'll make your analysis if there was misconduct and if it required discipline, right? right. Any questions on this? All right, cool. If we're crystal clear on that. Best story interviews, this is what we're talking about. Opportunity to consult. They absolutely have an opportunity to consult with their union rep. They can, uh, cannot refuse to attend the interview. And you see a three and they're like, I'm not coming down. You're not going to grill me. No, I'm kidding. You're not going to question me. I'm not coming down. What would happen if a bargain employee didn't show up? What would one of you supervisors, managers do? Or you could think they're insubordinate, right? Okay. Sandy, you have an online question. I do. Yeah. It says, do counseling. So I'm guessing this is a like a letter of counseling or letter of concern need uh, representation. Yes. I was going to talk about that. Let's finish this, and then I'll talk about that. So management has a right and obligation to conduct an investigation, provide employee a reasonable amount of time to confer with a representative, and the union rep can counsel the employee, advise them not to answer questions that are abusive, misleading, and harassing. We're gathering facts. We're not trying to get a conquest here. We're not interrogating. We're not kicking chairs and things like that. We're not threatening things like that, right? We're just gathering the facts. We can make an assessment. But the question was asked, can a bargain employee have a union rep when I'm issuing the LOR? Yeah, Is that it's, what they it's, asked? It's, it's, uh, do counselings need uh, representation? No. What did I say they got representation for? Investigatory interviews. That's it. An investigatory interview, they get a union rep. You want to have a staff meeting, you're going to open up a performance development plan, you're going to do an employee evaluation plan, open interims or close, they do not get union representation. Why? 
I think it's one of your managerial rights, sole exclusive right to evaluate, sole exclusive right to do an interim review and do a PDP and help coach and counsel that employee. So if you're bringing them in for a staff meeting or you're bringing them in to help them understand why they can't, they, they can't get 20 widgets an hour, they don't get a union rep for those discussions. You have a right to talk to your employees. You have a right to help them, you know, be educated, turn them around, send them to trainings, right? They don't get union representation. What Stephanie was saying at CWA, when, when her agency is issuing discipline, like a letter of reprimand or an NCA, Donald Leary from CWA, the president, is saying he doesn't have a union rep present with the bargaining employee. Can the bargaining employee have a union rep when you're issuing a letter of reprimand or an NCA or an NFA? Just no, they get a, they, they, we're now letting them have a union rep now. This is a new change. We're now letting them have a union rep when you issue the discipline. But folks, really, how long does that take? It's not a big hardship, right? I mean, seriously, you're not going to reinvestigate Betty. You're not going to ask her more questions. You're really going to say, here's your letter of reprimand. Please read it. Do you have any questions? Can you sign that you're in receipt of it? And you're moving on. It's, it's pretty much a done deal. And I've seen that with NCAs, NFAs, LORs. They can have a union rep present to observe that, but it doesn't take long. You shouldn't be re-questioning and just be, you know, helping them understand. Let's hope this stops here and let's move on and learn from this, right? But what Dustin was asking was that uh, if we take a ploy and we start asking them some questions and then we give them counseling, um, and we never told them it was going to lead to discipline, so we're counseling them and trying to help them move forward. We don't believe that should have union representation there. And I agree with Dustin, but be careful, right? Be careful. It's kind of thin ice. If you're questioning too much, the employee may say they took those facts and then that's why I got this discipline a month later, right? You've got to be careful that you're not going to result discipline. You're trying to use it as, okay, so let me understand it. Oh, yeah, you did do that wrong. Let me tell you how to do it right. That's good, right? That's just showing that you're trying to educate and train them and get them to be back up to speed, all right? Just cause, obviously, the board rule and the CBA have these definitions in there. Please ensure that's what you have to determine is just cause employer before you start taking disciplinary act, uh, action on this. So the board rule is defining it, and the CBAs both have this language, somewhat of language up here, right? And bargaining employees or bargaining employees after they serve there, right? Pre that, we've had bargaining, we've had probationary employees try to start payroll deduction for dues. And we've told the union, nope, we won't start them. They're still in the probationary period. Whether the employee knows the union got confused, I don't know. But this certainly will take the, the time frames with this, right? 45 days, we've all heard this over and over and over. Please make sure once you hear about the incident employer, you have 45 days to get that investigation done and issue that contemplated action or that letter of reprimand. 45 days, calendar days. So your Saturdays and Sundays while you're at home swimming in the pool are going against you. <laughs> well, what it says, if an outside agency or, or a division is not involved in the investigation, is involved in the investigation, then there is no 45-day window for you, employer. You've got an outside agency or division involved in the investigation with you, you're not under the 45-day window. But if you don't, then you have 45 days, or you use the last sentence that says facts and circumstances which require you a longer period of time. Employer, you'll have to defend that before the hearing. You'll have to persuade that arbitrator why you went beyond the 45 days. Why did it take you 70 days? What, what, what went down? And if you can elaborate those facts and circumstances, or your attorney can, you may persuade the arbitrator to say, yeah, those are great facts and circumstances, so they didn't violate this particular article or section. It was, it was, it was understandable why it took them 70 days. But you'll have to present that. All right? Yes, 45 days. Once you hear about the incident, then you need to get that investigation done and then start issuing your LOR or NCA. Now, why do we say LOR, NCA? <coughs> I'm not saying counseling letters. I'm not saying verbals. Why? Why are those not? I'm not calling them discipline, and I'm not under the 45-day window. They don't go in the personnel file. That's right. They, have, they don't necessarily impact a working condition, but when you start putting things in the personnel file, like the letter of reprimand or the NFA, now, that's a, that's a discipline. It's in their file, it's gonna follow them, right? All right, good.
considerations, folks. Please consider these things. Reasonable rule and work order. Those are your policies. Your attorney needs those policy signed acknowledgments as exhibits that we kept telling Betty White about the dress code and about the code of conduct and about whatever our culture, our environment is at our agency. That's what policies are dictating, right? That's the environment, the culture of that agency by policies. And so your policy acknowledgments are showing that Betty White can't testify and say, I don't remember. The last time I signed the code of conduct was 93. I just don't remember it. But if that truly was the last time she signed it and that's the only policy acknowledgement, you're probably in a lot of, be a little bit harder. Because I think Betty White's going to say, I don't remember what it said. So, you know, from years of experience, try to reevaluate policies as far as letting all employees re-review them. Three to five years. Three to five years. Max five. This keeps it fresh. Employees can't say they don't remember. And they, they've signed them. We've got a plethora of them. Notice, notice, notice. What are all the documents for notice? Is a verbal notice if it's uh, written? Is an LOR, is a letter of counseling, is an NCA, is an NFA, an employee evaluation, a performance development plan? Are those all notices? Absolutely. Policy acknowledgments, those are notice. Emails that you gave them, that's notice. Those are all notice. This is a big criteria. The employee need to knew, had to know doing this could result in discipline, right? Doing this could result in discipline, whether it's performance or misconduct. Sufficient and fair investigation, clean hands, employer. How many times have I heard the union tell the arbitrator, oh, well, Betty White's supervisor did the investigation and signed the, uh, the NCA. She's the judge, the jury, and the executioner. She's never liked Betty White. Clean hands. Maybe we have to have someone else conduct the investigation. Betty White's supervisor can sign the NCA if you want her to, but maybe she shouldn't be doing the investigation as well. Just think that out. How does it look? Perception. This often gets brought up in hearings. Um, so sufficient, fair, obviously, documentation to support it. Proof, you bear the burden of proof, employer. A disciplinary appeal, you put your case on first, and you bear the higher burden of proof that you had just cause. Then the union puts on their case and says you didn't. And then the arbitrator makes a ruling. Equal treatment, make sure Betty White's not getting fired and other people of somewhat similar incidents were only getting suspensions. Why did Betty get the dismissal? Now, Betty might have progressive, and we're there, but maybe not. So watch that. I've seen many of them get amended to what the other employees received. Employees that got dismissed ended up getting the suspension that other employees received because the arbitrator was persuaded by the union that there was similarities. It wasn't equal treatment. You're being harsher on this individual today versus those others. But you got to show, you know, we're being equal and or this is a different situation, and Betty White's got a lot of priors. And then, obviously, appropriate discipline. It does no good employer to say, you know what, I'm going to fire Betty, and if the arbitrator brings her, her back, well, that's on his hands, not mine. It's a horrible thing to say. It's a terrible position to be in. Betty's already mad at you guys for firing her. Trust me. If it gets amended, who's Betty's favorite hero? The super Stewart cape is, right? But if you do appropriate discipline, equal treatment, fair investigation, thorough, you can whip back your super supervisor cape and say, yeah, I'm a good employer, I'm a fair employer, and this is the right thing to do for Betty and hope she learns a lesson and grows and moves on, right? Wherever that might be, or it's a suspension or whatever. But be a fair employer, you're better off, and I think you can do that. But you're going to have... It's good to know these and evaluate them as your beginnings discipline or as an investigator. It's really got a good, strong case. You're better off to do that. I'm just highly recommending that. Um, key terms. These are in the CBA, and they often get misused. Does anybody know what a complaint is versus a grievance? Some of your agencies call a complaint a grievance, right? Mm -hmm. Some agencies' policy says an internal complaint process is an internal grievance process. But uh, a complaint, when I hear complaints, is based on agency policy and the employee is upset about something within the agency. And a grievance, they're filing something that is alleging an allegation of a violation of an article in the collective bargaining agreement. You can't grieve agency policy. You can only grieve the articles, the 43 articles in the CBA, and grievance arbitration says you can't grieve Article 1 and 2 anyway, so now we're down to 41. And you can't grieve the signature page, so now we're down to 40. So it just keeps going. 
Hot. Crazy to do Know the difference between a grievance and an appellant. A grievance is filing a grievance and going to arbitration. They're saying you violated the contract, employer. The union bears the burden of putting on their case first in grievance arbitration and proving to the arbitrator you violated said articles. And you put on your case second. An appellant is someone who is appealing their discipline. Even before an arbitrator, they're an appellant. The ALJ or an arbitrator, they're an appellant. They're appealing their discipline. A steward, a bargaining employee who has to be a member, who chooses or volunteers to be a steward, officer or official, because of the CBA, I think uh, AFSCME calls them officers and CWA calls them officials or vice versa. I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with it. Also has to be a member, can run for office. And then a classification finds the jobs. Classifications, what did the union organize? Classifications, not position numbers, not people, but classification. And then a position numbers are assigned to every job, right? So if you have three biz off specialists, you probably have three different position numbers. But these get confused when unions are asking for desk audits and all of a sudden all of these words get mixed. And to me, words matter. So it's a good while, time to train our stewards, right? And our employees on the, on the proper um, pronunciation of what's being said so we're truly understanding it. <coughs> Alternative work schedule is just that. At time and condition of employment, Betty White was 8 to 5, Monday to Friday. Now she wants a different schedule. That's an alternative work schedule. If Betty White wants to flex, it's not a flex schedule, but she's asking to flex her schedule today because she came in late. So instead of being short some time, she's willing to work late and flex her schedule to make up the late time. That's flexing the schedule. Job description versus a position assignment. The job descriptions on the SPO website, the big job descriptions to tell you what the classifications are and give you a broad overview of what biz ops specialists do. Sometimes it shows the A, the advanced, the basic, and the operational. And then a, a position assignment is what's being done at the agency level, right? And starting to narrow down a little bit of what that biz ops specialist at that location is going to do. Dues deductions, we talked about that, and people or code. So people in COPE is another deduction the employee can do through payroll deduction, has different purposes and goes to a different bucket. Dues deductions are broken up in three ways, if you didn't know. Council 18 gets a portion of it, the local gets a portion of it, and then their corporate office gets a portion of it. That's what they told me on dues deductions. Do we know the difference between an applicant and a candidate? This is critical because the contract speaks to candidate every time, never speaks to an applicant, always speaks to a candidate. All of us potentially are applicants, but not all of us may become candidates. You become a candidate and you get on the referred list. Now you're a candidate. All right? And then a personnel file versus a soft file. All right? Be careful on that. Any questions on those terms? Because they're in the CBA and they often get confusing. And I hear members say it and I hear employees say it. They often get confused. Good opportunity to educate them. And then here's our check test. I know the questions, the answers are in there. So how did we all do? Let's find out. Bargaining employees, they start to stop automatic payroll deductions for union membership by using the SPO card. Oh, oh. That's correct. Does everybody recall an email that went out that we withdrew the SPO cards from Director Coleman? All right, so that should have triggered a right answer there too. True or false, just over 50% of the total number of classified positions employed by state government are bargaining unit. Is that true or false? True. true. What percentages? Oh, what a group. Look at that smart group in the room. I'm hoping the cyberspace have the same answers. All right. True or false, Public Employees Bargaining Act established the PLRB, which stands for the Public Employees Labor Relations Bureau. Who's false is false. What's? It's not called a bureau. It's called a board. All right. Cool. Which of the following is not a management right? Direct the work up higher, promote, assign, transfer, suspend, terminate, remote, none of the above? None of the above. Are they all management rights? Yes. Number one, aren't they? True or false? A bargaining employee may require union representation, well being, discipline, getting served a letter, discipline, and during an investigatory interview. True. All right. True or false? Weingarten rights are the same as Miranda rights. False. Why do we know that? <laughs> You've all been arrested? <laughs> oh, too much information. They're not. 
Miranda rights obviously could get someone off, right? Just because we violate uh, Weingarten rights and give them a union rep doesn't necessarily mean everything goes away. But it's certainly not going to be helpful because they will argue it profusely. So when a bargaining employee invokes the right to a union representative investigatory interview, we do what? We allow it. Now, can the bargaining employee slow you down and say, oh my God, I want John Wayne as my steward. He's on vacation. We'll have to conduct the investigatory interview when he returns. No. What? Right. You got to get someone who is available, a steward who is available. The PLRB is ruled and concurs. It's about someone who's available. Now, if Betty White wants John Wayne, I'm cool with it if he's available. But if he's not, Betty White needs to find a steward who's available. All right. Um, where are we at? True or false? A grievance is alleged violation of agency policy. That's correct. Internal complaint possibly could be. An employee, true or false, an employee shall not be issued a letter of discipline after 45 days of the employer acquiring knowledge of the misconduct. It's kind of a trick, right? You can't, but there may be facts and circumstances that made you that you went over 45 days. You're just going to have to, your attorney's going to have to really put on his best attorney hat and discuss those facts and circumstances, right? All right, because a good attorney will. And he's always pretending he's like swabbing, smoking and drinking martini. I'm so good, right? That I can tell you the facts and circumstances, and the arbitrator's going to go, those are good ones. Continue, employer. All right. Um, an employee, okay, uh, true or false, an employee of bargaining classification is eligible for all the privileges of a collective bargaining agreement, regardless of their paying membership. That's true. true. That's true. Final last one, the Supreme Court decision of Janus versus AFSCME ruled that unions could no longer collect fair share fees. That's true. All right. Did we get? Did we do better? Did we get 100% at the beginning at the end? Did you learn one or two things? I bet your bureau got you all messed up, right? That was the trick hard one. Any questions from anybody? If not, I am two minutes bonus. That means I continue to get paid when I walk out of this office because I ran under allowed, baby. Bring it! <laughs>